I'm asked that question a lot. And a lot of it stems from a fundamental misunderstanding of a CEO's role. What is it that a CEO does? First of all, understand that CEO is a job title and it basically is the top person on the totem pole. Now a CEO may report to a board of directors or depending if it's a small company, they may not have one. But at the end of the day, the only authority that the board has, they don't have any direct operational authority. The only authority that the board has is generally speaking to replace the CEO. And for all practical purposes, that's all they can do. So it's the CEO who really is the final arbiter of all things. So let's discuss a little bit about what it is that a CEO actually does. A lot of people confuse what a CEO can do with what a CEO actually does and with what a CEO needs to do to be to, in order to be a CEO. So for example, a CEO is responsible for everything. At the end of the day, everything that happens in the company is the CEO's responsibility. That's one of the reasons that a lot of CEOs say, oh, the company did incredibly well, you should pay me trillions and trillions of dollars, because they want to take credit when everything goes well. Interestingly enough, those same CEOs rarely use that logic when things go wrong. Then they say, ah, we had some bad apples somewhere else, wasn't me, and they still take the trillions of dollars. But the ostensible justification for those trillions of dollars is that it's the CEO who is responsible for everything. The buck stops there when there are hard decisions to be made or easy decisions to be made. They are the final arbiter and final authority over those decisions. They have the higher firepower. They're essentially the absolute dictator of the organization. And that's just simply how we work organizations. So a CEO is responsible for everything. Now, how does a CEO actually spend their time? That's the interesting thing. Because they're responsible for everything, they have higher and fire authority and essentially complete control over everything that happens, they can spend their time however they want. In small companies, there are CEOs who spend their time emptying the garbage and talking to people. In large companies, there are CEOs who spend their time managing by walking around. When I heard that, I always thought I can walk around also. Um, maybe I can be a CEO someday because walking around isn't really that hard. And if it is hard, you can get a motorized wheelchair. But some other CEOs manage by the financial statements. So what they do is they pour over financial statements all day and they make decisions based upon these numbers. So in the course of a day-to-day -day observation of those two CEOs, if you were to watch them, you would see them doing something entirely different. One would be walking around, talking to people. The other would be sitting at a desk, pouring over numbers. But yet both of them are CEOs and depending upon the company, both of them can be highly effective. So the way that a CEO actually spends their time and spends their day is, is not necessarily an indication of what a CEO in general does. We know they're responsible for everything, which doesn't really narrow very much down. We know they can actually do anything, which again, doesn't narrow it down. So what distinguishes a CEO uniquely from everyone else? And for that, we need to ask, what are the things that a CEO does that can only be done by the CEO? And if the CEO is not doing them, they're not gonna get done, or they're going to get done just by random happenstance. And there's four of these things that I concentrate on. <clears throat> First and foremost is a CEO sets the strategy of the company. Because they have yes, no authority over all decisions, they decide the strategy that the company is gonna to use to succeed in the marketplace. Now, if you don't know what strategy is, I could do another video on that at some other point, but strategy is essentially saying, how is the company going to be perceived in the marketplace? How is it going to respond to its competitors? And how is it going to deploy its resources? How it's gonna spend money, the kinds of people that it's gonna hire, what it's gonna have those people do, such that the company can accomplish its goals in the marketplace. Strategy is a, a vague and mysterious thing. Uh, I, I don't know that it was really thought about much prior to, a, I believe about the 1960s, 1970s but it turns out to be fairly essential. For example, one of the things that happens in strategy is acquisitions of, acquisitions of new lines of business or expanding into a new line of business. That would be a strategic decision. So let's say that, that you had a bookstore and the bookstore decided that, gee, uh, we want to get into the business of selling groceries. And so they went and acquired a grocery chain. That's a strategic decision. And at the end of the day, it's the CEO who decides, yep, 
the most sensible strategy for us to proceed and to succeed in the marketplace is for us to diversify from books into groceries. Now, there may be very valid reasons for doing this, and you're probably already thinking, hmm, he's describing the Amazon.com acquisition of Whole Foods. Yes, I am. However, in other, for other bookstores, maybe for your neighborhood bookstore that's owned by a mom and pop, trying to expand into being a grocery might not be a good idea. But it's the CEO who makes the call for an alternative growth strategy. The CEO could decide, you know what, we're going to put all of our efforts towards really getting people to buy more books. And instead of this grocery store strategy, we're going to go out and find people who don't have books, but who are celebrities or who are sports figures or who are people who we believe that with their name behind it could sell more books. And our strategy will be not to expand into a different line of business and a different product, but instead to expand into more of the same product, but give ourselves a wider product base and then do a lot of marketing to hopefully get people to buy more books. Those are both strategies. Uh, you know, they may be appropriate for different companies. One may work, one may not. Regardless, it's the CEO who finally signs off on it. The CEO might hire a consulting firm, like a McKinsey and Company is a management consulting firm, Bain, BCG. If you've heard these names, these are the management consulting firms. Uh, these are some of the really big ones. And what they may do is they may come in and on the CEO's behalf, they'll analyze the marketplace, they'll analyze the capabilities of the company, and they will decide, you know what, given the marketplace, given who the competitors are, given the regulatory environment, given the capabilities you have as a company, we think these are the ways that you should succeed in the marketplace and that you should grow and the new products you should put out, so on and so forth. However, even though the consulting company might be the one doing the bulk of that research, the CEO says yes or no. It is the CEO who controls the company's strategy. The second thing that only a CEO can do is lead the top team. We organize our companies hierarchically. There are a few companies, for example, the Gore Corporation that makes Gore-Tex, that are not organized in this kind of hierarchy, but those are rare enough that I'm going to stick with our standard corporate structure. And in the standard corporate structure, you have a hierarchy, and the CEO is the person at the very top. What that means is the people one level down, generally business division units or, uh, or vice presidents or directors, depending on the size of the company, whoever it is that's the CEO, they are the person who leads the team of those people right beneath it. Now, what it means to lead a team in an organizational sense is it means coordinating. It means making sure that what is going on in with one of your team members meshes with the efforts that are going on with another team member, such that at the end of the day, the two work together and whatever the company's work product is gets turned out on time, on budget, for the right price. In the case of the senior team, this might mean making sure that the product development organization is working in line with the marketing organization, which is working in line with the company's finance department to make sure that the money is correct and we can afford to do the things that we're doing and so on and so forth. If there is nobody running that senior level team, then unless you just happen to get a group of people who are spontaneously amazing at working together in a collective, which I can count on zero hands, the number of times I've encountered a group of people who are really, really great at operating without somebody fulfilling a coordinating role, whether or not they have higher th fire authority is a separate issue, but there is an actual coordination function and the CEO is the only one who can do that because the nature, again, of organizations, at least of hierarchical organizations, is that it's only someone higher in the hierarchy who can manage a group, a particular group of people. And in this case, that means the CEO manages the senior team. Whether they want to or not, whether they step up and do their job or not, that is a fundamental part of the CEO's job. And if the CEO doesn't do it, it probably is not going to get done. The third thing is being a role model for acceptable behavior and corporate values and culture. And this one, this one can't really be delegated. The problem or the phenomenon is that human beings are hierarchical creatures. We look to the people upper, upper, we look to the people higher than us on the hierarchy for cues about how to behave. If they behave in a certain way, we feel free to behave in the same way. If they don't behave in a particular way, and we do behave that way, and they come down and say, no, 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 not acceptable, then we stop behaving that way. And this seems to be, I, I've never read science on it, I'm making the following statement up, 
but this seems to be hardwired into humans as far as I can tell. It seems like as soon as somebody is labeled as being in a position of power or authority, if they have a lot of money, if they're dressed in the right uniform, people automatically look to them for cues about how to behave in times of crisis and also how to behave in times not of crisis. Because the CEO is at the top of the company, at the end of the day, they simply are the model that everyone at the company looks to for direction. If the CEO makes it a practice to, to show up and kick people out of the parking spot that's closest to the door and make sure that they have a private lunchroom and that the only people who get to see them are the people at the very top of the company, and then they talk about how they want to have an egalitarian workforce where everybody can walk up and talk to everyone else, but they don't behave that way, then neither does anyone else because everyone looks to the CEO and says, that person is not living up to what they say, why should I? In fact, you can see this not just in companies and in organizations that are business organizations, you can see this in the political arena. One of the questions that a lot of people, uh, that a lot of people don't, well, people ask what difference does it make, for example, who the leader of a country is? And the answer is, if you take a look at it, the leader sets the tone. Now, that's a fluffy, nebulous statement, but that doesn't change the fact that it seems to be true. When a leader behaves in certain ways, that legitimates those behavior patterns for everyone else. Which means, if you're a CEO and you waste money on frivolous things, other people will feel like they too can waste money on frivolous things. If you berate people in meetings and insult them and and trash their ideas, other people will feel like that's acceptable behavior. If, on the other hand, you make it a point to hear everyone out, people will take the message that that's an important behavior. There are some CEOs, for example, who say, if you want to bring a proposal for a new project or a new product or a new business line into the, uh, into the company, you have to present a pitch and you pitch it to the CEO. And the CEO has to become convinced. When the CEO listens to a proposal and then says, look, you didn't do the right financial analysis, you didn't check out the markets, and gives a whole list of criteria that should be in that presentation, people take that criteria, they spread it throughout the company, and it can become part of the culture. So that's one of the key pieces that a CEO does, whether they want to or not, their behavior becomes modeled by everyone else at the corporation. Now, when I say everyone else, of course, not every single person, but it becomes a standard by which people, which people use to judge what is or isn't acceptable. And if the CEO behaves in ways that they forbid other people to behave, then other people may compliantly behave the way the CEO behaves. However, they're going to go, yeah, right, this is a hypocritical statement and request on the part of the CEO, and it's going to foster cynicism at best and really bad morale and possible actual undermining of the company's goals at worst. So... Like it or not, the way a CEO behaves makes a powerful values and culture statement to a company. And then lastly is resource allocation. Resource allocation is really that the CEO ultimately approves how money gets spent in a company. This is related to strategy. The CEO says, okay, you want to build, you want to acquire a chain of grocery stores, Mr. CFO or chief marketing officer, whoever, I'm willing to sign the check to make that happen. At the end of the day, even though a company does have a chief financial officer, it is the chief executive officer, the CEO, who approves where money does and doesn't get spent. And they approve everything that the CFO proposes, in fact. If the CFO says, hey, we should take out a loan, ultimately, even though it may be the financial functions, uh, the financial department's function in terms of figuring out the financial strategy, the CEO makes the yes or no decision. And when it comes to spending money, that can have huge, gigantic consequences. If the CEO decides they're going to allocate a $50 million a year budget to sweeping the floors in their chain of restaurants, they get to make that decision. And that will have a different impact than if they say, you know what, we're going to spend at most $2,000 on our entire chain of 450 restaurants to sweep the floors. The way that the CEO decides about money impacts which things can and can't get funded within the company, which then determines what the experience of the company's product and service and future plans are like. So I hope this has been helpful. Once again, a CEO can do, they're responsible for everything. They can do anything they want to in terms of how they spend their time. But at least four of the elements that, that are unique to the CEO that the CEO really cannot delegate 
because at the end of the day, they are responsible for these things and no one else is, is number one, setting the strategy, deciding how the company is going to compete in the marketplace, and broadly speaking, what course of action is it going to take to be able to win at the game of business. Two, managing the senior team. It might be like herding cats, but in that case, the CEO has to be a cat herder, and they have to do that because they're the only one in the organizational position to be able to do that. Number three is modeling the culture and the values. And again, this is less an organizational phenomenon and much more about how people look to their leaders for signals about what is acceptable behavior and about how to respond in times of uncertainty. And then finally, resource allocation. The CEO ultimately signs off on the big checks, and they have to approve the budget and decide where money is going to be spent. Uh, and if they decide wrong, those impacts will be felt throughout the organization regardless of what other people in the organization think and regardless of whether or not those are wise financial decisions to make. So I hope this does a good job of summarizing and articulating exactly what it is to be a CEO.